Good morning everyone. In the news now is a story that broke yesterday. And the reason why I didn't cover it yesterday is because I had already put out something on a huge court case uh, and a subsequent judgment that was handed down in the Concord of South Africa, South Africa by Chief Justice Mohoeng Mohoeng. And another big judgment was handed down yesterday. And this is a very controversial case because there was only one state witness and two, perp two people were actually found guilty of murder or homicide and they were actually sentenced to imprisonment. And now this has been turned around by the Supreme Court of Appeal. And this will certainly raise the ire of many people and bring relief to many people. So I just want to cover what happened in this instance and give you my perspective on the history and the future with regards to this. Because this is once again something that people can use to incite hatred and to try and get the country to fall into a state of a civil war or a race war or whatever you want to call it. And it's something that the country ill can afford and that the people of the country don't feel like at all. Because if they wanted something like that, they would have done it a long time ago. So, in this News 24 article, the headline reads, Bungled investigation, one eyewitness fabricated testimony why the Caligny accused were acquitted. So, the article that broke yesterday, or the news that broke, is that the Caligny, the two accused people in the Caligny case, where a young boy died, had been acquitted completely. They are free men. And the sub headlines read 16 years old, uh, 16 year old uh, Matomola Masho died on April 20th, 2017 in Caligny in the Northwest. Now, this was a very uh, familiar case. It was all over the news at the time. And I'll be going to the Northwest next and spending time there in January with meetings. So um, I'm really looking forward to visiting that area. But this case at the time caused chaos in the area. Peter Doerwaard Duer and Philip Skutter were originally found guilty of murdering Moshoyu by throwing him off of a moving bucky. Now, no one actually witnessed this or actually uh, could prove that this happened. It had to be assumed somehow. And this is a tragedy. What happened here is a tragic story. And I really feel for the family of this young boy. And I feel for everyone involved, uh, um, the people that ended up uh, in prison for a long period of time, they were obviously without their families, it's just a tragedy all around. And uh, a loss of life is never a good thing, and we have to look at how this actually shaped up, and how this happened. The Supreme Court of Appeal found that Dorewald and Skutter were not guilty, and overturned their convictions and sentences. But we need to understand why, and the detail is very important, because... Remember in court, it's all about proof and proving beyond a reasonable doubt that there is criminal intent. The Sup Supreme Court of Appeal, SCA, has acquitted the two men previously found guilty of murdering 16-year-old Matlamola Mosheu, finding that the state did not prove the, the case beyond a reasonable doubt. And that is what needs to happen. It needs to be beyond reasonable doubt. So it doesn't mean... That the act didn't happen it means that it couldn't be proven despite the split in the outcome of the appeal all three appellate judges agreed that the standard of proof for a criminal trial was not met and this is important so the fact that an appeal court has found that that wasn't met but another court actually found the man guilty is a huge problem with regards to our criminal system and this is where personal bias and many other things can come into play just the fact that you don't like someone's face can make a difference in how you actually act in court. And you certainly shouldn't be a judge if that is the case. You need to work on the merits of the legal system. And this is both a good and a bad thing. This is why the legal system needs a complete overall. We need to do away with this British rubbish that we're sitting with now. They say here that the only eyewitness in the case had contradicted himself and that police displayed incompetence in the way the matter was investigated. So that already is a problem. When a witness cannot give a proper statement, it changes everything in any case. 
If any witness contradicts themselves just once, you cannot trust any of the rest of the witness. You need to be a good witness. And a judge is supposed to judge it without bias. The versions in a nutshell. The state's case rested entirely on the evidence of a single eyewitness. Now, this is generally problematic. If it was two people, it's seen as extremely likely that something happened. So two eyewitnesses is always better than one. Bonakeli Pakisi, who claimed to have observed the deceased being assaulted and was handled by Peter Doerwaard and Philip Schutter before being thrown out of a moving bucky. <coughs> Pakisi also told the court that both Doerwaard and Schutter had approached him to find out what he had, been, had seen and then subsequently assaulted him repeatedly and forced to drink strong liquor before being threatened at gunpoint. So this is all uh, what this one single state witness uh, Bonakele Pakisi actually said, that was his version. Dorwart and Skitte said that after they caught the deceased stealing sunflowers, they arrested him and told him to climb onto the back of the bucky. Now, it's difficult to actually understand what happened here, and no one can really prove it unless you were there. So someone died because they were, according to the accused, stealing, while well, the past accused, stealing sunflowers. Now for someone to die because of sunflowers is not justice. There's something terribly wrong there. And that is why a court case is necessary. And that's why this entire situation is a tragedy. To die because of sunflowers, things could have been done differently. And this is important. So how these two men behaved and based on my past and understanding how people have behaved in the past, what I've seen with my own eyes, there's a lot of bias that would develop in different people's minds from different backgrounds, cultures and religions on what played out here. And this will certainly raise ire and emotion and for others a lot of relief. <coughs> so this is something that is divisive and that's never a good thing. While taking Monsieur to the police station, they stated that he jumped off from the back of the bucky. Now, that is a very simple uh, version. It's an easy version. It's easy to say that this happened. Very easy to say that. <coughs> My question is, if they wanted someone on the back of the bucky, why would he stay there? Why wouldn't he just jump off immediately and run off? You know, these are all questions that a person could ask. Why would two people be in the front of the bucky while driving to the, to the police station to have the person arrested? Maybe they only drove to the police station after he had died and they knew they would get into trouble. But that again gives them softening circumstances. So the boy could have totally sat on the back of the bucky, then driven to the police station, him changed his mind and tried to jump off and then injured himself. They went back, picked him up. They did take him to the police station. So... Those are circumstances that count in, in their favor, except for the fact that this actually happened because of sunflowers, which is absolutely ridiculous. They turned the bucky around and found that he was still alive but injured. They then decided to drive to the police station for help and for arrangements to be made for an ambulance. Now, this is the biggest thing counting in their favor. The fact that they actually went back picked him up. This means they don't want him to die. They never intended for him to die. If they had planned murder, they would have just killed him, shot him or, or whatever the case may be. And this certainly didn't happen. Convictions and sentencing. In 2018, Dorewaard and Schutte were found guilty of murdering the teenager. So a murder charge. It was alleged that Monsieur was thrown from a moving bucky and died as a result of the injuries incurred in April 2017. Now, I cannot see how he was thrown off. If you were driving someone to a police station, I cannot see why you would then decide to throw the person off the bucky at all. Um, the person would have to jump. That I can accept. But if you're already driving somewhere to plan to now put the person on the back of the bucky and one of the people on their own, just throw him off the back of the bucky at speed, that is quite something, unless you have solid witness for it. If there's a solid witness for that, these men should go to jail for the rest of their lives. And um, I would be so infuriated. Um, yes, I, I mean, that would be absolute savagery. The Northwest High Court found Dorewaard and Schutter guilty of murdering, kidnapping, intimidating, theft and pointing a firearm. 
Judge Ronnie Hendricks at the time said the murder was not planned and not premeditated. So what he is saying is that they didn't plan this before and it just happened as things developed. He found the incident happened as a result of Dulles Eventualis News 24 previously reported. Less than a year later in 2019, Dorewaard was sentenced to an effect of 18 years imprisonment, while Skitter was sentenced to an effect of 23 years in prison. Following an appeal heard in the SCA, the, the Supreme Court of Appeal, the Apex Court on Friday set aside the convictions and sentence, sentences finding Dorewaard and Skitter not guilty and discharged. All three appellate judges were of the view that the case was not proven beyond a reasonable doubt, that the eyewitness testimony of Pakisi was contradictory and even deliberately fabricated, and that the police investigation was bungled. Now, I, I'm not privy to exactly what this witness said at this stage, so it's difficult to uh, judge that myself, but I have to trust that these three judges know what they were doing. Ledwaba found that Pakisi's evidence was tainted by material discrepancies and that there was nothing to collaborate his testimony. Now this is what I mentioned earlier. There was no other person that could prove what he is saying or any other evidence that collaborates what he is saying. Obviously a post-mortem was performed and they would have understood what the cause of injury was. They would have been, see, been able to see if this boy was beaten or not. That's the other thing that you can see in a post-mortem. Were they bruising or anything like that that would come from blows or punches um, to, to, to actually see if the men mishandled him? This included the fact that Pakisi in his affidavit to the police said Monsieur was thrown from the bucky on three occasions. However, during the trial he said the deceased was thrown from the bucky once. Now that immediately um, says that there's something terribly wrong. Pakisi also testified that Monsieur bleed, uh, uh, was bleeding profusely while on the back of the bucky, but test done on the loading bin of the bucky found no traces of blood. Now, that tells you that the person giving the evidence was completely and utterly wrong. Assuming that the vehicle that was tested was in fact the bucky that was used to ferry the boy, who Mr. Pakisi says was bleeding profusely, the results of the hexagon orbit test uh, cast serious doubt on the testimony and credibility of Mr. Pakisi, who is a single witness, Ledwaba said. So this is one of the judges. Interestingly, the, the trial court found these unexplained discrepancy not to be materially added. Now that is ridiculous. It means the previous judge um, doesn't understand basic science. You know, gravity, blood actually falling to the bottom of a bucky. It should be everywhere, in fact. I mean, anyone that's seen a crime scene will know that blood uh, stains everything. In this regard, the court st uh, stated that what is material is the fact that the deceased was thrown from the bucky, which is consistent with the evidence, as testified by, Ms. by Dr. Murad. I disagree particularly because, save for the evidence of Mr. Pakisi, there was no direct or satisfactory evidence that the boy was thrown from the bucky. In my view, there are material discrepancies in the evidence of Mr. Pakisi. He is a single witness and there is no corroboration to his evidence. Ladwaba added that experts who testified in respect of times and calls made by the accused confirmed their defense and contradicted the version of Pakisi in connection with the areas traveled, the distance and the estimated time it would take for the said trips. So, what most likely happened based on evidence is exactly what the men said, that the boy jumped from the back of the bucky while they were transporting him to the police station. They went back, picked him up and then took him back to the police station and then got medical help. Ladwaba did however point out that Dorewaard and Skitter's version regarding how the deceased apparently vanished from the bucky was not satisfactory. So there's still questions to be asked. With the evidence layout, the acting appellate judge said the state still had to prove its case beyond a reasonable doubt. So the judge is saying that there might still be something wrong here. He's not uh, fully happy with the men's version and there's probably more to it. In agreement with Ledwaba, Judge Molamela also found that Pakisi's account did not meet the standard set for the evidence of a single witness and that his evidence as a result did not pass muster. She also pointed out the inherent contradictions in Pakisi's testimony. In my view, the bungling of the criminal investigation impacted on the strength of the state's case in particular, on the reliability of Mr. Pakisi's evidence, Molamela said. I agree with the court 
a quo's finding in relation to aspects which tends to attest to Mr. Pakisi's honesty, such as the fact that he knew that the first appellant was a driver of the Bucky on the day in question, and also his description of the injuries sustained by the deceased, which were independently confirmed by the paramedics and the police officers who attended the scenes, scene as well as the post-mortem results. Furthermore, even though Mr. Pakisi had not met the appellants before, his description of them was accurate. So what the judge is saying is that he was there, but that he was giving a wrong account of what had actually happened. These experts make it difficult to conclude that Mr. Pakisi's entire version constituted a fabrication. It is nevertheless tried that the evidence of a single witness can only sustain a conviction if it meets certain requirements. Honesty alone is not sufficient. The witness must also be reliable. So the witness was not reliable and this is a big problem. And this is why the judges had to find against the witness with regards to his version. Molomela, however, did not agree with the application for discharge, which is a remedy provided to a person who has been charged maliciously with false allegations made against them. She was of the opinion that facts of this case justified an inference of gross negligence, and I agree completely, and that she would have set aside the conviction for murder and replaced it with culpable homicide. Now, that is something that could be considered, but that is something that a full bench would have to do. She came to this decision based on the fact that the arresting monsieur meant that both Dorewald and Schutter assumed the duty of care to ensure his safe conveyance to the police station. And that's 100% correct. And this is an important thing you need to un understand. The moment you make a public arrest, and you're allowed to do that, you are then responsible for the life of that person. They put him in the back of the bucky, and immediately, whatever happens to that person, you can be seen as just being negligent. And she's 100% correct in that. The appellate judge said they did not take the necessary steps to prevent Monsieur from either jumping or being ejected from the bucky given the light of the circumstances in which he found himself in on the bucky. She further found that approaching a bend at 60 km an hour on a gravel road en route to the police station was unreasonable, especially under these circumstances. So what she is saying is that these, these men were negligent. And certainly a case can be made against them and can be heard again. And uh, we will see what the family does in this case. Appeal Judge Nathan Pon uh, Ponnen. Ponnen wrote a separate concurrence agreeing with Lord Dwaba that the appeal should be upheld. He there, uh, had there been a sufficiently careful assessment of the evidence in the docket, the public interest and the law, perhaps some doubt would have been entertained as they were there uh, as to whatever there was on the basis of sufficient and admissible evidence, reasonable and probable cause to believe that the appellants are guilty of an offence and that conviction was a reasonable prospect, Panan said. Panan further pointed out other discrepancies in Pakisi's version, including that no evidence was found that there were quad bikes at the scene, a third accused gunshots had been fired and that he was severely assaulted by Dorewald and Skitter. And you can actually see if someone was severely assaulted or not. In short, the prosecution's case consisted of Mr. Bakisi's say-so and nothing more. No effort appears to have been made by either Khorane or Unkosi investigating officers to satisfy themselves as to the truthfulness and reliability of Mr. Bakisi's accounts of events. So what they're saying is that the police officers were biased in this case. And this was problematic. In my view, even the most profound a perfunctory, perfunctory interrogation of his version ought to have satisfied them of his mendacity. Not only is there no objective corroboration for Mr. Pakisi, but his version, such as, such as it is, is riddled with inconsistencies and contradictions. So what he's saying, this should have gone no further than the police themselves. Because the police's version became a problem in this case. They just took sides. And I've actually seen this before. In my, my own personal life where police can use their culture and biases to make really bad decisions. And this is problematic because they need to use the constitution and the law. This was further bolstered by the fact that Pakisi later reneged, having said the deceased thrown from the bucky a second and third time. A contradiction which was also referenced by the other appellate judges. Quoting from the record, Ponan said, There is no room for honest mistake and that his evidence cannot be true. And this is obvious that his evidence cannot fully be true. This must mean that on the aspects mentioned, which are by no means exhaustive, his evidence has been deliberately fabricated. 
The fact that Mr. Bakisi was guilty of deliberate falsehood required the High Court to consider whether he could be safely relied upon. Well, it's obvious that you cannot rely on his testimony and it's a pity because if he just gave proper testimony, they could probably have found that there was uh, negligence and there could have still been actions taken. Like I said earlier, for someone to die because of sunflowers is ridiculous. Panon also found that the state did not call another witness who was said to have taken Pakisi's initial statement, as the testimony would have exposed Pakisi as a liar. Panon also disagreed with Molomela about the culpable homicide charge, stating that one of the established facts, there was no negligence. Okay, so to him, there was no negligence. He said there was suggestion that the speed Dwarwart and Skitter were traveling at was excessive, dangerous and reckless, which placed doubt on whether the deceased was being thrown around the back, lost his balance or was catapulted from the bucky. So what, they, what he is saying, he probably did jump and injure himself. Now that is the end of the article. There's a lot to think about here. The one thing that a person needs to remember is that if you do a, a citizen's arrest, and I've done this on numerous occasions in the past, you are responsible for what happens to that person. So think about that. The police are supposedly trained in this. They, of, they often mess up, even although they are trained. So one needs to be very careful when you do something like this. It's absolutely tragic that a young boy lost his life. It's tragic that he was stealing sunflowers in the first place and then died for it. We need to change the circumstances in this country where people don't need to resort to things like stealing sunflowers to, to try and earn an income or whatever it was that he was trying to do. This is certainly something that should be seen as unnecessary and we need communities to fix things like this. And if you come to my meetings, I'll discuss a plan with you that can resolve things like this, where people can work together, but it's going to take political will, it's going to take social will more than anything else, and it's going to take people to love. And love is very important when it comes to something like this. If there's no love, there cannot be justice served. I thank you very much for watching this video. Please subscribe to the channel and click the bell icon so you can get notifications on future videos. I'll be preparing now to leave for the poll meeting, which will start in a while. Thank you to all of you, those who have contributed towards these meetings, towards the tour, towards the channel, to make it possible for us to do this work. We're still going to need substantial funds to go to the Northern Cape as well as Northwest. So we thank you for even the smallest contribution, even a 10 Rand or a 20 Rand, that all adds up when it all comes together and then we can go and continue with this tour. The meetings in Cape Town are continuing. They've been laid out every Saturday, these meetings with meetings in the week with individuals and many other people. And I'll update you in the meetings as to what's happening on the ground. Thank you very much. Till the next video.